Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and welcome back to the final episode, part four on Disney. Our first episode was about Disney's history. The second was about Disney World and the abuse there. And the third was about the Disney Channel and the horrific acts behind the scenes there. And today we're talking about Disney and their power. We know Disney abuses their power and we've seen it already, but we're going to get into some more modern examples of this. First and foremost, let me state that by no means is this everything Disney has ever done. Despite this series already being the length of a whole Disney movie itself, I doubt I could really give a comprehensive guide of everything because there's so much. Still though, I hope this series can help give an inside look into the side of Disney that they tried to hide, dismiss, or brush aside. So anyway, let's get back into it and start off with how Disney handles their trademarks. Now, I understand being protective of your characters, your creations. So this argument may fall into some very murky gray territory. Yet Disney is so protective that it's raised quite a few eyebrows over the years. Back in 1989, they threatened to sue several daycare centers in Florida for having life-size paintings of Disney characters on their walls. And there was massive public outcry despite Disney technically having valid reasons to threaten legal action. As one source explains, here are three legal reasons why Disney decided to threaten to sue three daycare centers. One, you need to proactively protect your trademark. In response to the public outcry, a spokesperson for Disney issued a statement. If Disney were to allow the daycare centers to use the characters, then we would have to allow everyone else to do so. If we don't protect our trademarks, we could lose our copyright and be out of business. Disney made an incredibly important point. Protecting your trademark doesn't stop the day you complete your registration. Two, it's unfair to those who do pay to be a licensee. This is self-explanatory, so I won't read the entire explanation. Three, using a trademark without a license may suggest affiliation. If the daycare centers continue to use Disney trademarks, people may naturally think that the daycare centers are affiliated with Disney when in fact they're not. The affiliation seems harmless. I mean, they're daycare centers. How much controversy can they raise? But partnerships are a tricky thing. You want to make sure your ideologies are in sync. If not, you'll be pleading guilty by association, supporting whatever propaganda your affiliate company may be touting at a certain point. Now, I don't disagree with Disney needing to protect their trademark characters in the same way that a small business owner would want to protect their own original works. That's understandable, but I won't pretend that their actions haven't been questionable at times. Back in 2019, Disney demanded that a school district creating a Lion King movie fundraiser pay about a third of their fundraiser money, $250 out of the $800. The Disney place wanted some money because they own like all of the movies. The PTA president said that one of the fathers of the parents bought the movie at Best Buy. He owned it, so they didn't know they were breaking any rules. Even when someone has requested licensing, they aren't always accepted either. One grieving father asked Disney if he could put Spider-Man on his young son's tombstone as quote, Spider-Man was Ollie's entire life, end quote. Disney refused his request though, and the father stated that he believed the company was trying to disassociate its characters with death. That makes no sense to me, he said. Characters die in their films all the time. Even after a petition to Disney amassed over 12,000 signatures, a representative stated that the decision was made as a result of a policy made by Walt Disney himself, which does not permit the use of characters on headstones. Disney suing small theaters, daycares, schools, whatever the case may be, it's oddly common. And I can see both sides of the argument here, whereas they seem lawsuit happy, but they aren't really wrong for doing so legally. Plus, it does seem almost as if the anger over this is because Disney is just such a massive corporation that they don't exactly need the money. So taking $250 from a kid's fundraiser feels like a low blow. Yet if this were a small business, I bet more people would be inclined to support them and agree that they deserve to be paid for their work. Regardless of where you stand on what side of the argument, and to be honest, I'm very much in the middle because I see both sides and this is very gray and murky to me, but there's no denying how vehemently they protect their characters to the point of changing laws to keep others from using them. When Mickey Mouse was made, copyright protection only lasted 28 years. By the mid 20th century, Congress doubled the maximum term to 56 years. 
Then in 1976, Congress overhauled it and instead of fixed terms with a maximum 56 years, individual authors were granted protection for their life plus an additional 50 years before their work became public domain, free for anyone to use. For works authored by corporations, the terms were extended to 75 years. But in 1998, this wasn't good enough for Disney as copyrighted works from the 20s were scheduled to begin falling into public domain. Their extensive lobbying campaign became known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, though formally speaking, it's the Copyright Term Extension Act. Again, as much as I understand their desire to protect their character, lobbying Congress to change the laws to suit them is a bit extreme and it shows just how much power Disney has. One source says, Sprigman, a legal scholar at New York University, sees public outrage over the 1998 extension as a catalyst for the copyright reform movement that came of age with the protests that stopped the Stop Online Piracy Act last year. None of that would have been possible without the loss of the CTEA and Eldred, he argues. One advantage opponents will have this time around is better arguments and evidence. Public debate over the last extension has stimulated increased academic research into the economics of the public domain. And as a result, we know a lot more about the costs of longer copyright terms than we did 20 years ago. One striking example, a study looked at the availability of books published in the last 200 years on amazon.com. Surprisingly, the study found that there are more printed books available from the 1880s and 1980s. When books fall into the public domain as works from the 1880s have, anyone is free to republish them. In contrast, books from the 1980s are still in copyright, so only their original copyright holder can give permission to distribute them. As a result, older books are actually easier to get online than newer books are. That means that the 1976 and 1998 extensions have deprived a generation of readers of easy access to books from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. Disney's lobbying hasn't just impacted Disney. It's affected the publishing world, other acts and laws that have followed all simply to benefit themselves. Sprigman argues that the only reason to extend these terms is that it gives private benefits to Disney or Time Warner, and copyright isn't supposed to be about corporate welfare in the first place. With this extension, Disney's beloved Mickey Mouse is supposed to fall into the public domain on January 1st, 2024, and Superman, Batman, Snow White, and early Looney Tunes characters will follow in 2031 and 2035. In the next couple years, I'm pretty confident that we will see some pushback on Disney's end, but I question if they'll really be able to keep fighting this forever. It's not as if Disney can't profit off Mickey Mouse merchandise and sales once he's in the public domain. It just means they'll have competition. Now, some sources have speculated that what will happen when Mickey does finally hit public domain. After all, his trademarked white gloves weren't worn in Steamboat Willie. So if you wanted to sell a Mickey toy with white gloves, you'll need to wait an extra year or so when the copyright for the first Mickey with shorts and white gloves from the Opry House is scheduled to expire. Then, since the early Mickey Mouse cartoons were in black and white, you'd actually have to carefully research when his colors first appear if you wanted to sell Mickey merchandise. I think it's hilarious to imagine that all these old timey Mickeys suddenly on the market, just kind of everywhere, yet Disney keeps changing the copyright laws to suit their needs, so who knows, this may not actually ever happen. Frankly, I find Disney's actions shady for a whole slew of reasons. The first is obvious, and it's that they're changing the laws to suit their needs. But the second is that Disney profits off of public domain works in the first place. Think about it. Their movie, Tom and Huck from 1995 was based on the adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain in 1876. Aladdin is from a 1706 folk tale in 1001 Nights. Alice in Wonderland is from the 1865 Lewis Carroll book and Beauty and the Beast is from G.S. Barbeau de Villeneuve's 1775 book. A Bug's Life is from Aesop's Fables. Cinderella is part of Grimm's fairy tales. Frozen is based on Hans Christian Andersen's 1845 Ice Queen. Hercules is from a Greek myth. The Little Mermaid is also from an 1837 Hans Christian Andersen story. Mulan is from a Chinese legend. Princess and the Frog is from the Brothers Grimm folktale. Robin Hood is from English folktales. Have I made my point? Most of what Disney has created is derivative, even if they put their own spin on these tales. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. This just shows Disney's flawed thinking as if it's only okay when they do it. As Forbes explains, the content industry has argued that their copyright is their natural right property, seeing that the founders never agreed with and our constitution makes it clear is not the case. Under the content industry's logic, they have argued that reusing others' work without paying them is always stealing and they have pushed for more and more restrictions upon doctrines like fair use. 
One of the content industry's most ardent supporters in Congress, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, has even directly ridiculed the concept of fair use as being theft by comparing it to being a little bit pregnant, arguing, how do you go snip just a little bit of what somebody has created? We have to begin to look at this issue. Not as just snippets, but we have to look at it as theft. The first Mickey Mouse film, Steamboat Willie, was itself a parody of Buster Keaton's film, Steamboat Bill Jr. Hell, not only has Disney created parodies, some say they've straight up just stolen from the Japanese anime, Kimba the White Lion from the 1960s when they made Lion King. Others say they're not the same at all and the journey of these two characters is extremely different. They're both just about young lion princes and you can't own that concept. This could be an entire topic in of itself. And there's a two and a half hour video analyzing this from a YouTuber, yourmoviesucks.org. So I'll leave that in my sources if you wanna take a look at that too. Again, since everything is derivative, I can't fault Disney for this, but it's upsetting that Disney won't allow anyone to do what they've been doing for, it seems nearly their entire existence. It's hypocritical at best, extremely shady and upsetting at worst. Aside from the lobbying surrounding Disney, I wanted to see if they've really improved. After all, while they may not be making movies like Songs of the South anymore, and they're putting disclaimers on their older and obviously racist films, what about now? Are Disney films still racist and raising girls to believe that their purpose is to find a prince? Well, it may not be as outwardly discriminatory as before, but there's still a few bones to pick with Disney. Hope Wabuke in her article, Disney's Disembodied Black Characters, points out that in The Princess and the Frog, as well as their recent movie, Soul, Disney has yet to have a happy movie with a black protagonist. Soul centers around the main character dying. The protagonists in Princess and the Frog are animals most of the film. Lack of representation is still a problem. I won't pretend that they haven't done some tremendous good with movies like Moana, Raya, and The Last Dragon, and Coco. They also have a movie to be released this year called Encanto that takes place in Colombia. Yet as many steps forward as Disney has taken, this doesn't mean we should ignore some of their massive steps backwards. Some have claimed that in trying to be more inclusive, Disney's brand of representation has become cultural appropriation. Yashu P. Lachurla from the Hofstra Chronicle writes that, Raya and the Last Dragon is set in a fantasy location inspired by the entirety of Southeast Asia. That concept already raises many flags. Despite meaning well, a movie lumping together any large group of people and co-opting their culture and experiences for representation is just an easy way for Western creators to check us off their diversity list. Just as how it is racist to conflate the entirety of East Asian culture, the rest of Asia also deserves the same pushback from audiences when it happens to that area's cultures. The peppering of various familiar elements from Southeast Asia in the film doesn't take away from the fact that unless referred to by its original name, a lot of those symbols can be construed as having been added to fit the vibe instead of for authenticity. The film reportedly draws from any and all cultures of Southeast Asia. So how are we to know that Rhea's hat is specifically a Filipino salicot or that the soup from the movie is Kongi? Those details are nice to infer, but with Hollywood and Western media's track record, it's hard to trust anything other than an official statement that these choices were made intentionally and not just to provide a Southeast Asian feel to the film. Similar to how Disney casted light-skinned South Asians for the role in their 2019 Aladdin live action, these unsubstantiated additions to the film contain no actual representational value. The main grievance, however, is the casting. While Disney is working to diversify on-screen talent, this should extend to voice acting roles. Kelly Marie Tron, a Vietnamese American, voiced Rhea and is the only person of Southeast Asian descent on the main voice acting cast. So that begs the question, is Disney actually attempting to be inclusive in their movies or are they just trying to seem inclusive for profit's sake because they know that racism isn't going to go well with their audiences now? Not to mention the majority of Southeast Asia doesn't have access to Disney Plus, so they can't even watch the film. It looks fantastic on paper, yes. And I'll admit that when I saw the trailer and I heard they hired Asian actors and actresses, I was thrilled. It's disappointing that once you dig a little bit deeper, it's pretty clear that this movie, according to one source, treats Southeast Asian cultures like a buffet. Not every one of my sources feels the same on this point. NBC News points out that just like how every Game of Thrones could be seen as a mishmash of Western history, Rhea is clearly a fantasy world with a mishmash of Southeast Asian influences to tell a story. 
Whether or not you love or hate this movie, feel its cultural appropriation or not, the next couple examples I'd like to go over are a bit more black and white. The live action Mulan has been called inevitably bad, while others call it a lightning rod of controversy. Shirin J. Sao made a YouTube video about everything culturally wrong with the 2020 film, and their video became so incredibly popular that it gained almost 3 million views as of writing this. And as a brief aside, many of you mentioned them to me during the Wu Zetian video as they were coming out with a book in September, 2021 called Iron Widow, which should be out by the time this episode goes live. And it's called Iron Widow and it's a retelling of her story. So feel free to check it out. It sounds amazing. I am absolutely going to be taking a look at it because I love the history of Wu Zetian. Anyway, regardless of the many things culturally wrong with this movie, Shirin breaks it down better than I ever could. It's Disney's attitude about Xinjiang that upset people and sparked the hashtag boycott Mulan movement. Not only did the lead actor, Crystal Liu Yifa, declare her support for Hong Kong police after they committed acts of brutality against the Hong Kong protesters, but people were furious with Disney themselves for how they handled the situation. According to Variety, Disney made global headlines when Mulan released to its Disney Plus platform on September 4th, 2020, gave special thanks during the film's ed credits to eight different Chinese government departments in Xinjiang, a number of which are directly involved in the campaign that critics have deemed a cultural genocide. They include the Turpin Bureau of Public Security, which was last October sanctioned by the US Commerce Department for engaging in human rights violations and abuses in implementation of China's campaign of repression, mass arbitrary detention, and high technology surveillance against Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other members of Muslim minority groups. In a letter dated October 7th on official Disney letterhead, Bailey, the president of the film production wrote in Disney's defense, It is standard practice across the film industry worldwide to acknowledge in a film's credits, the cooperation, approvals, and assistance provided by various entities and individuals over the course of a film's production. In this case, the production company Beijing Shadow Times provided our production team with a list of acknowledgements to be included in the credits for Mulan. And we have actually specifically spoken about the abuse and horrors that are happening against Uyghur Muslims on this channel before. Now, On YouTube, at least, the episode was very much suppressed and it actually totally tanked my channel's ability to be in recommended or even show up in people's subscriptions for just over a month. But I think it is still an important topic to discuss and it is still on my channel now. Whether or not it is a standard practice to thank these people, many believe that Disney simply didn't want to offend China or that they care more about profit than human rights. As an aside, most of the film was actually shot in New Zealand anyway. The only footage that was shot in historic locations in China make up about 78 seconds of the film's 115 minute runtime. Now that's not to say that they shouldn't have filmed these locations by any means, but it sure doesn't sound mandatory for me to thank officials that are committing these horrific acts either. Now, another example of this is probably most hilarious and upsetting to me has to do with Day of the Dead. And by hilarious, I don't really think it's funny, but I just think it's absolutely ludicrous. Disney tried to trademark the Day of the Dead to sell Coco merch. They wanted to secure the rights to the title Day of the Dead and themed merchandise like fruit preserves, fruit-based snacks, toys, games, clothing, jewelry, footwear, you get the idea. Disney withdrew its application after the backlash, but the fact that they even tried to trademark this in the first place is gross. And this is not the first time either. They tried to trademark SEAL Team 6, the Navy SEAL team that captured and killed Osama bin Laden, seeking exclusive rights for use on items from video games to backpacks. And this is just, it's mind blowingly stupid. This is not a small blunder. It's not a little mistake. It's beyond cultural appropriation. It's blatant disrespect. And I'll be honest, I absolutely loved the movie Coco, but it makes me like just beyond disappointed in Disney as a company that produced this when it sure as hell feels like they're just trying to use it as a money machine to go without any respect to the actual culture itself. And by technicality, Pixar is actually the one who produced it, but they're owned by Disney and Disney filed the trademark. So you know what I mean? They're kind of holding hands here. Lalo Alcaraz, a Mexican-American cartoonist best known as the creator of the comic strip La Cucaracha tweeted, on the offensiveness scale, it seems awful and crass as the words Dia de los Muertos aren't just some brand name, but a holiday. 
Has anyone else heard anything about this? It has to be a hoax. How can you trademark a cultural tradition? Tweeted Kathy Cano Murello, an Arizona-based artist and author who incorporates Day of the Dead designs into her art. Now, it is of note that some people denounced Lalo for working with Disney as after this incident, they hired him to work as a cultural consultant. Several people did celebrate this development, but many called him vendido, a word for a sellout, accusing him of, as well, selling out for the monolith he'd spoken out against. And frankly, I'm in the camp that I disagree with anyone who would say this. Alcaraz justifiably called Disney awful, but then was hired you know, to help them not cross that line again. We should celebrate whenever a corporation like Disney hires, pays, and listens to anyone calling them out. It's the only way for a company to make some real change. But Disney clearly has a long way to go if they were trying to trademark Day of the Dead in 2013. So the more cultural consultants they have, especially those that have proven their willingness to be critical, the better. A fourth example of their cultural appropriation was when Disney started selling a Maui costume complete with a patterned brown bodysuit to make the character Maui look like they had the tattooed brown skin. Critics called it racist and mocking Polynesian culture. One Polynesian writer said that our brown skin is not a costume and others referred to it as a kind of blackface. Marama Fox, co-leader of New Zealand's Maori party accused Disney of aiming to make a profit off the back of another culture's beliefs and history. It's no different to putting the image of one of our ancestors on a shower curtain or a beer bottle, she said. On Twitter, at Samoa Planet posed the question, is this cultural appropriation at its most offensive worst, hashtag brownface, or just a fun celebration of Pacifica? Others on social media described the faux skin costume as creepy and called for its withdrawal. Now, Disney did eventually pull a costume, though there's still a lot of debate around what Disney costumes are okay and which aren't. Cosplaying as a character is one thing, but it's wearing a brown skin suit that there's, you know, that's where many understandably drew the line. Now, before we continue on to discuss Disney and queer coding, I wanna just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors who have helped allow this entire four part series come to life. At this point, we've all had some pretty terrible experiences with wireless providers that have endless fine print contracts and the price for it just seems to be coming more and more expensive every single year. So when I first started working with Mint Mobile and they were offering premium wireless service that started at just $15 a month, I was a little bit skeptical to be totally honest. I was a little bit like, it can't be that good. Well, it turns out it actually just, it is that good. I have switched my phone plan to Mint Mobile for almost a year at this point and I can't really, I can't really complain. There's really not been a single problem. The service has been great. Everyone is super friendly. It's easy to pay my bill, recharge my phone. It's kind of a little too easy, honestly. I feel like I've been conditioned that dealing with your cell phone provider is an absolute train wreck. So for this to be so easy, so simple, and I don't even have to call because I don't like calling people, like that's the best. So if you wanna get started with your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. Spooky season is finally upon us. And you know what that means? Maybe you wanna go outside and walk and take a look at the beautiful leaves changing colors if you're somewhere in the world where it allows you to do that because that doesn't apply in Colorado. But more importantly, it's gonna start getting darker out sooner. It's gonna start getting a little chillier, a little nice breeze here and there, perhaps even some snow a little early on. And that means I'm not going outside anymore. It's done. The outdoor season, she is closed for the year. And that's why I love having HelloFresh. They are able to deliver fresh pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering recipes right to my door. So I don't have to go to the store and I can get right to cooking. And HelloFresh is endlessly customizable. There's so much for everyone. It doesn't matter if you need family-friendly meals, low calorie or vegetarian options. They have a little bit of everything to make sure that you enjoy what you're eating, but that you can also like get outside your comfort zone and try something new. I had no idea how to make curry. I know I'm white, it's absolutely shocking, but I was able to make this like lentil curry, I think it was like a couple weeks ago on the menu, oh my God, I have never enjoyed something so much. And one of my favorite parts about HelloFresh is there is a ton of flexibility. You can control everything about every single one of your shipments, your meal plans and everything right from an app. So you don't have to call anyone. You don't even have to go on your computer. You can just literally do it right from your phone. So go to hellofresh.com slash casket 14 and use code casket 14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. That's up to 14 free meals, including free shipping at hellofresh.com slash casket 14 with code casket 14. 
Now, very briefly before I continue, I wanna talk about Disney and queer coding. As a member of the LGBTQ plus community, I thought it was important to address. I'm sure many of you have heard this mentioned before and to be blunt, I wasn't sure where else to fit this, but I figured it seemed appropriate after mentioning Disney's modern questionable acts. Right off the bat, I adore the history of Ursula. I highly recommend looking into the channel called Dream Sounds and their analysis called The Unique Queerness of Howard Ashman's Songs. I saw that video a good year ago. It has to be about a year ago now. And I knew I had to mention it at some point during writing this as it's a fantastic analysis of composer Howard Ashman and Ursula. Without a doubt, Howard put queer contributions into Ursula and the Little Mermaid, but it's not with malicious intent. Howard Ashman was one of the greatest queer artists of his era, immersed and inspired by that culture. He created the song, Part of Your World, and even insisted and fought for it to be a part of The Little Mermaid. Now it's one of their most iconic and well-known songs. In a demo where he sings it, you can see a quote, passionate embrace of the isolation and longing that defines Ariel's character, end quote, according to Dream Sounds. He also taught Jody Benson how to sing it, emphasizing every word, every cadence, and shown in old recordings of his coaching. Again, I highly recommend this video to better understand the background of the film. It is a fantastic watch. However, setting that aside, multiple articles online have pointed out that the majority of classic Disney villains have queer characteristics. According to The Tempest, for example, male villains like Hades, Captain Hook, or Jafar tend to have effeminate mannerisms or appearances. They get easily scared, are very expressive when they speak, have high-pitched voices, and are preoccupied with their looks, usually wearing makeup and looser clothes similar to dresses. Basically, they do not conform to typical heteronormative codes of conduct, and they are made fun of and criticized because of it. This is called queer coding, and it's a problem. The thing is, whether you identify man, woman, neither, something else entirely, a little bit of both, you can wear makeup, dresses, and have a high-pitched voice. I don't think it should matter. These things don't need to be gender exclusive. Makeup is for anyone who wants to wear it. The point here is that when Disney time and time again associated male characters with what are viewed by our society, at least then as traditionally feminine characteristics, it's putting the psychological association out there that queer equals evil. Another source explains that the Disney Renaissance was birthed after a decade of HIV AIDS ravaging queer communities. It's height marked by political milestones such as President Clinton signing the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996 and the institution of Don't Ask, Don't Tell for LGBTQ plus members of the military. Divergent non-normative sexuality was purportedly a threat to society and Disney, ever the quiet institutional soldier, answered by providing a veritable stable of queer coded villains who were ill-suited to lead or assume power. Indeed, there were so many queer coded villains in this period that it's hard to remember them all, let alone the different lessons they taught us. To wit, you probably remember Scar, Jafar, and Ursula, but you have probably forgotten Governor Ratcliffe from 1995's Pocahontas, the fashion conscious, social climbing, crown appointed governor in charge of the colonizing mission to the new world. None of these sources say that they don't want queer characters and far from it. Simply that Disney has a lengthy history of portraying the villain as queer and not the protagonist. Disney has absolutely broken away from this and the trope of the queer villain isn't prevalent in their films the way it used to be. That said, the argument could be made that no, Gaston from Beauty and the Beast wasn't effeminate. Why should being vain be considered an effeminate trait? Or that Ratcliffe wearing pink shouldn't be considered effeminate either as clothes and colors shouldn't be gendered in the first place. Once again, it seems to come down to a matter of intent where sources argue that Disney intended to make these characters seem queer, associating it with villainy, although its intent is an incredibly tricky topic to navigate in reality. There have been openly LGBTQ characters in their films now, though so far they have been largely minor roles. Again, while we can be grateful for the improvement, I think it's important to recognize the past as something to be learned from. Now for our final section, our final question of the series, does Disney have too much power? Now Disney has a ton of subsidiaries, A&E Networks, Marvel, ESPN, 21st Century Fox, National Geographic, FX, The Muppet Studio, a massive part of Hulu, Lucasfilms, Hollywood Records, most of which I've barely even touched on in this series. Posts worrying about Disney's power are pretty common online and they have been for some time. Brett Hines wrote on prospect.org in 2019 that, This has been an incredible year for the Walt Disney Company. Not only has Avengers Endgame become the best-selling movie in box office history, but Disney currently holds all four slots for this year's top earning films. However, the company's dominance isn't quite something to celebrate. 
At the moment, almost 38% of all US box office sales in 2019 have gone to a Disney owned movie, down from a peak of over 40% earlier this year. And that's even before coming releases of Frozen 2, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, the Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. As we can see by looking at the US box office over the last 30 years, Disney has more than doubled its already significant market share in just five years, reaching an unprecedented point in modern history for a film company. Within the next couple years, there is a good chance that the majority of all money made from wide release movies will go into the pockets of the Walt Disney Company. Even if you consider yourself a dedicated Disney fan, this should concern you. The US economy is in the midst of a concentration crisis in which industry after industry is being dominated by one company or a small handful of companies that control markets and Hollywood is no different. The harmful effects of this are far reaching with damage done to competition, wages, business formation, innovation, and more. Disney's emergence as a monopoly power in the film industry threatens the viability of creative independent films, places movie theaters under exploitative pressure, limits the diversity of films available, cheapens our culture, and worsens economic and political inequality. There can be no denying that Disney practically has a monopoly on the industry at this point. Independent distribution companies struggle for their spot in major theaters, and Disney has the resources to buy, take over, and dominate new market innovations that would threaten their established business model. We've already seen some hefty lawsuits emerge against Disney Plus recently when Scarlett Johansson sued because she claims her agreement with Disney's Marvel Entertainment guaranteed an exclusive theatrical release, and her salary was based in large part on the box office performance of that film. Other sources say that people are scared of Disney because of how much they own. They own all the mythologies variety states. Long ago, Hollywood was called the Dream Factory. Now it's as if Disney alone is the Dream Factory. Film Daily also points out that they own at least a third of the film market by themselves now, while others like Lion King director Jon Favreau state that the company is not a monopoly. And yes, he's probably a bit biased, but I wanted to hear some kind of opposing view. Anyway, The Observer writes, Yes, it's a consolidation, certainly of IP with Disney, but Disney is finding themselves in a position where they have to be competitive with companies that are playing by a different set of rules in the financial space because they're tech companies and growth companies, filmmaker John Favreau recently told The Hollywood Reporter while discussing Hollywood's balance of power. Of course, the director of Disney's The Jungle Book and The Lion King, who has deep ties to the Disney-owned Marvel and is serving as showrunner for The Mandalorian on Disney Plus is going to avoid criticizing the hand that feeds him at all costs. But that doesn't mean he's wrong. Disney may be the most successful studio in town, but it's hardly the most well-armed combatant in this blockbuster war. The Mouse House is valued by Wall Street at around $247 billion, far behind the likes of Facebook, 514 billion, Google, 808 billion, Amazon, 873 billion, and Apple, 920 billion. In many ways, the financial reality of entertainment media today is rigged against traditional companies in favor of long-term tech stocks or the growth companies Favreau spoke of. Wall Street gives them a longer leash. How else is Disney meant to compete given the layout of the playing field? Hate the game, not the player. And he does have a point that Disney is simply competing in this game like any other massive company out there. And they are certainly a massive player. Even so, whether or not Disney created this game, how they play it out has also been a matter of contention. On the note of power, let's talk about their expansion throughout the world. Though we mentioned Michael Eisner's early years as CEO when he was the man that saved Disney, his need for expansion has done more than raise a few eyebrows. Ignoring the advice of experts, Eisner built Euro Disney near Paris, France instead of Southern Spain. Even though Spain offered a year round warm weather, local climate and boasted that they needed infrastructure, Eisner believed Paris was a more prestige location and insisted it be built there. This became what some would call a cultural Chernobyl as one source explains. Disney knew that building a fairy tale theme park in Europe would be a tall order as many elements Americans find exotic like castles are common tourist attractions in France. To their credit, they did an excellent job on the design angle. However, they failed to account for one big thing. You see, Disney went out of its way to try and accommodate European culture. It's even in the name Euro Disneyland. The issue? There's no such thing as European culture. There's Italian culture, Spanish culture, British culture, Irish culture, hundreds of different cultures that aren't even consistent within the same country sometimes. Disney was a predominantly American company trying to tailor a theme park for a collection of cultures they didn't fully understand. And that's before we get into French culture because the clash between Disney and their host country is infamous. 
Not to mention, they brought their bad track record with them, and there's even been some massive incidents and death at Euro Disney, a handful of which seem to be largely due to the park's poor safety regulations. Of course, Disney also expanded into Hong Kong and Shanghai as well, and Tokyo, as we mentioned before. Sure, the park has had success, and there can be no denying these theme parks' popularity. Yet, if people enjoy the parks, some sources paint these expansions in a different light. Four decades after Disney's launch, for example, Disney executives committed to expanding their smallest theme park. They acquired new land, renovated a parking lot, and plotted unprecedented attractions, some of which went against Walt's wishes. Not that he was around to protest, obviously. This source claims, they established a checklist of items they wanted to accomplish with the Disneyland expansion. One of the oddest aspects on this list was the inclusion of California itself. The company's power players lamented the fact that Disney didn't dominate the state tourism market to a degree they desired. In Eisner's estimation, Disney should own California as a kind of paid tribute to Uncle Walt. He sought to increase the value of the world's original theme park by adding elements from other popular California landmarks. In the process, the second gate at Disneyland would restore the balance on the company's balance sheet, siphoning business away from local competitors. Who were the enemies who threatened Eisner's beloved balance sheet? No, I don't mean Universal Studios Hollywood or even Knott's Berry Farm. Disney never viewed other theme parks as viable threats to its bottom line. The competitors who caused Eisner to see shadows included Yosemite National Park, Sequoia National Park, Joshua Tree National Park, Newport Beach, and Napa Valley Wine Country. As crazy as this sounds, Eisner resented that theme park tourists might choose to get in touch with nature rather than spend every waking moment at Disneyland. This unusual thought process is the underlying mechanism that explains why Eisner led Disney down a bad path. This mindset of needing to control absolutely everything is not all that far removed from a classic Disney villain, really. Not only was California set to expand, but plans were actually announced recently to expand the Parisian location as well. Even if Disney may be able to afford the Paris expansion in the present day, back when Eisner was calling for all this growth, Disney certainly didn't have the budget to make multiple parks entertaining and safe. Back on Christmas Eve in 1998 at the California location, the ride the sailing ship Columbia was in a state of disrepair due to deferred maintenance. Staff cuts left an untrained manager not familiar with the proper safety protocols working the dock. As a result, a heavy cleat tore from the ship, slinging it into the crowd, severely injuring a family, with one of these injuries resulting in death. No matter how fantastic the parks are now, at the time, they were disasters with cheap off-the-shelf attractions and clearly dangerous. Whether you see Eisner's legacy as a good thing for Disney or a horrible one, or a mix of the two, there is really no denying the power he put in Disney's hands. The same could be said of former CEO Robert Iger, who took over after Eisner in 2005. Last year, Iger thought he'd be leaving Disney on a high note, but instead ended up retiring during the coronavirus crisis. Overall, this attitude of prioritizing money and power and control over, well, basic safety is a disturbing one. If these other parks are managed in the same way that Disney World is now, then I feel terribly for the employees that work there. So sure, like we said, to some extent, you should hate the game and not the player, but Disney is one hell of a powerful player, creating their own rules as they go along. Before we wrap up this series, I wanted to share a few brief final thoughts. Firstly, I know I wasn't able to cover absolutely everything, and I know there's entire YouTube channels dedicated to just talking about Disney. And I'm sure there's many parts of Disney that I can further break down into future very specified episodes. But I hope you can generally see that after about 28,000 words and a 57 page long script and like almost two hours worth of content or a little over, I simply still could not fit in everything, but I tried to cover some of the more important larger pieces. Secondly, even though I know this is gonna sound a little bit insane, I'm not gonna try and get anyone to stop watching Disney or enjoying Disney after this. Yes, I did just make a four part series covering many of their errors, but that's because I'm sure most of you know what joy their movies can bring and there is some good in them, yes. But I don't say any of this to try and get any of you to hate Disney either. If you wanna curl up with a Disney movie after this, by all means, enjoy it. The only reason I really wanted to make this was to address some of my own concerns and to bring awareness to some of these issues at hand and perhaps to leave a few questions in your head. Disney has a lot of power and no matter how much you love them, they should be held accountable for their actions too. In many cases, I don't feel like they have been. The abuse of innocent animals suffered on Discovery Island, the way their workers are treated as disposable and how they have consistently ignored sexual assault allegations. It's all extremely worrying. 
whether or not you think Disney is improving, how can people really be expected to move on when they haven't really apologized either? I feel that it's important to know what we can about these titans of industry because after all, this script has proven that our voices can make a difference at times. If not for the massive backlash, they may not have retracted their trademark filing for Day of the Dead after all. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket and this four-part series about Disney. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new throughout all of this. And thank you for spending your valuable time out of your day to watch this or listen along with me. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.